right, open your Bibles to 1 Samuel. So last week, uh, last week, yeah, last week, okay, seems like it was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, last week, you know, uh, we read about how Saul went to the, the little witch of Endor <laughs> to try to get advice from Samuel, and uh, Boy, he got a little bit more than he bargained for when he went to get advice for her, from her, I should say, uh, because when Samuel did appear, and we talked about whether this really was Samuel or not, um, it appears to be truly Samuel, as uh, he knows a lot of very intimate facts as he's talking to Saul. But one of the things he's told Saul, if you look in uh, chapter 8, in verse 19, he tells him, Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me, and the Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hands of Philistines. So we have a prophecy there from the prophet Samuel, and uh, after he's already uh, died. So a very bizarre chapter, but uh, we're going to see that prophecy and how it comes to pass uh, this evening. So let's pick this up in chapter 29. It says, the Philistines gathered together all of their armies at Aphek, and the Israelites encamped by a fountain, which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed by in review by hundreds and by thousands. But David and his men passed in review at the rear with Achish. And then the prince of the Philistines said, what are these Hebrews doing here? Achish said to the princes of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, who has been with me these days or even these years? And to this day I have found no fault in him, since he defected to me. But the princes of the Philistines were angry with him, and so the princes of the Philistines said to him, Make this fellow return, that he may go back to the place which you have appointed for him. And do not let him go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become our adversary. For with what could he reconcile himself to his master, if not with the heads of these men? Is this not David, of whom they sang to each other in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. So you remember now that David is living in a, a city called Ziglag. The, the, uh, the king gave him that city uh, with an agreement made that David and his men, you, you might remember he has, I think, 600 guys in his little army, and they made kind of a treaty um, with the king there and uh, made a deal that David would fight with Achish, the king, and uh, defend them even if it came down to fighting against his own people. And again, that seemed very, very strange to us as we read that, that David was a turncoat a traitor, if you will. And uh, so, you know, why the Lord allowed that kind of stuff, allowed David to do that kind of stuff, I don't know. Uh, one thing I do know for sure, though, that later in David's life, he had a lot of regrets. He had a lot of failures during his life. And perhaps... What we can see in that is a lesson, if you will, is that we all have faults. We all fail. We all could betray an agreement or a person or what, whatever it might be. 
it seems from our text that these people, you have at least three groups here of people. You have Israel, the Hebrews, you have the Amalekites, and the Philistines. The Amalekites and the Philistines encompassed a lot of different little villages and tribes in the area, uh, in the southern Judah area there, geographically. And it looks like, to me, that there was a lot of treachery that took place. There was a lot of men who said, hey, you know, uh, Achish's army is stronger than this army, so I'm going to go fight with Achish against that army so that I'll live. David now has connected himself to Achish, and they made this agreement. So he's been living there now, as you can see in verse 3 of chapter 29. He's been living there for years. And he was going out, David and his 600 men, and they were going into all these villages and little towns and raiding them. Philistine towns. And taking their stuff and bringing it all back to the king, to, to Achish. Bring in the spoils. And so David was very profitable uh, for this king. And uh, they're getting ready to go to battle against Israel. So you have Achish and you have the Philistines coming together to go into battle. Now, you have probably seen, I know you have, film of like China or Russia where they're having these army celebration, military celebrations, and there's thousands of people marching together, and all the tanks and everything are rolling down the road, you know. Well, this is what's going on. The Philistines are gathering together, and they're, they're getting ready to go into battle, and you have the, what they call the lords of the Philistines there, the commanders, the guys that wielded all the power, and the armies were marching before them. They were parading before them, and it's called a review. So those of you who have a little bit of military background probably know that term, that a lot of times that's what the army will do, is they'll march in front of their commander, and it's a review, so to speak. So that's what's going on at the beginning of the chapter. They're getting ready to go. They're all passing in review in front of all of the uh, commanders of the Philistines. And King Achish and his people, along with David and his people, are in the back of the parade. And they're kind of taking up the rear there. And as they do, these Philistine commanders think, what is this guy doing here? He's a Hebrew. Why is there a Hebrew in the ranks? Good question. Really good question. And I think that the commanders of the Philistines here, uh, they didn't like David very much because after all, he killed their guy, right? He took a lot of them out over the years. He raided a lot of their camps. He, he was a pain in their rear for many, many years and they did not like him at all. And so they're questioning the king here. Why are you allowing David to be a part of our group. I don't want him to be a part of I don't trust him. We're going to get out on the battlefield and he's going to turn on us and fight for Israel and destroy us and start cutting off our guys' heads. So I don't want him to come. Send him back to Ziglag. Send him back to the area that you gave him to live. Now you might remember Achish gave him Ziglag and his wives, and his sons, and daughters, or, and all the army, the 600 men, their families, they all lived in, Aka, in uh, Ziglag. And it was, a, it was a enemy territory that he was living in. So Achish calls out David in verse 6, and he said, Surely as the Lord lives, you have been upright. And you're going out and you're coming in with me in the army is good in my sight. For to this day I have found no evil in you since the day of your coming to me. Nevertheless, the lords do not favor you. Therefore, return now and go in peace. 
that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. And David said to Achish, But what have I done? And to this day, what have you found in your servant as long as I've been with you? That I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king. <clears throat> Why would you think that I would turn against you? I've been with you all these years. And, and look how he addresses uh, Achish. He calls him my lord the king. That shows you just how bad it got as far as his allegiance to this king. And you may also notice that the word Lord and the word king are not capitalized. So it's not Jehovah, because it would be a capital L if it was. So he's... He's saying this in a way that is not betraying his God, but yet he's acknowledging the authority that Achish has as the king. And so Achish answered and he said to David, I know that you are as good in my sight as an angel of God. Now notice the word God. It's capitalized. He's talking about Yahweh. He's talking about Jehovah. He's talking about David's God. But nevertheless, the prince of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to the battle. <coughs> so the Hebrews, they had quite a history. As a matter of fact, the Philistines, the Hittites, the Amalekites, all of the ites and the mosquito bites and all those people that lived in the area out there, they were aware of the history of the Hebrew people and how God delivered them from Egypt. And they were very aware that the Hebrew God was truly the big God. They feared him. They acknowledged who he was. So he tells David... In verse 10, get up early in the morning with your master's servants who have come with you. And as soon as you are up in the morning and have light, depart. So David and his men rose early to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. They were going to go back to Ziglag. And so the Philistines went up to Jezreel to go into battle. So now it happened that when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire. So while David was gone trying to give his allegiance to the enemy, his home was attacked. Ziglag was burned to the ground. That's a huge error on David's part. He should have been there protecting his people. He should have been there protecting his own. But instead, he chooses to take his men and try to go fight for this king who is not his friend. And here come the Amalekites. Once again, we find that, that name there. And they snuck in the south, into Ziglag, and attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women and those who were there, from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but they carried them away and went their way. That's how important it is for us to stay at home, to stay where we belong, to not stray away from the things that God has given us to be responsible for. Because when we find ourselves aligning ourselves with the world or with the enemy or with ungodly people, we put everything else at risk. It's amazing how you can make a decision 
And it might be a self-centered decision. It might be a decision that you're just trying to protect yourself, maybe. But your decision can affect the ones that you love in a terrible way. And, you know, that's true in just about everything. Um, people who have drug problems, people who have alcohol problems. It's always the people that are closest to them that get hurt the most. That's what sin does. It hurts the people that are closest to us. It causes a tidal wave of trouble, if you will. And we get selfish. We think that our wants and our desires, our needs, what we think are our needs, are more important. And we maybe get a false sense of security thinking everything's okay at home. I'm going to go run around a little bit. I'm going to go sow my oats. I'm going to go do what I know I shouldn't be doing. And I'm invincible. So there's not going to be any consequences for my actions. And then we learn the hard way that we're just like everybody else. And when we make bad choices, bad things happen. Now you might say, well, if a bad thing happens to me, then that's my thing. That's my problem. I brought it on myself. But that's not usually how it plays out. Usually it plays out to where the ones that are closest to us, they're the ones that get hurt by that tidal wave of trouble that we create. And so here we find David. Now just think. If he would have went out to battle. And in a sense, you know, David's making stupid decisions here. He's making dumb choices. For years now, he's been making dumb choices. But God's still with him because God still has a plan for David's life. God is still controlling David's life, even though David thinks he's in control of his life. That's the amazing thing about God. You can stray if you choose. But if God's got a call on your life, if you're one of his kids, and you think you can stray out there without any consequences of it, and you're making the choices, God really is behind the scenes working. It might cause a lot of pain. It might cause a lot of regret, a lot of loss. But as we're going to see in David's life, as in our lives too, eventually you have to come back to God. There's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere to turn. And I know that some of us, even in this room, have been out there in the world and we've tried to, to do this. To walk away from the things that we know are right and true. And become so self-absorbed that nothing else really matters anymore except for what I want. And then we see the price that is paid for it. And I know that our hearts break for the people that we've hurt. And we come to realize what a fool I've been. Would God take me back? Does God still love me? Am I still his child, even though I've been camping out with the enemy all these years? Has he forsaken me? And we find out, no, he hasn't forsaken me. He won't forsake us, ever. Even though we choose to walk away from him, he won't forsake us. He has ways of bringing us back in, doesn't he? Reeling us back in a little bit at a time. Some of us are a lot hard-headed more than others, you know. But think for a second if you were Peter. Now, Peter's whole career, he really thought he was about something. He really thought he was important, didn't he? And he was. Anywhere there's a list of the apostles, his name is on the top of the list. 
And he got to see some things and do some things that the other men, they, didn't, they weren't allowed to see or do. He witnessed some acts of Jesus that the other apostles were not allowed to see or participate in. And you would think that nothing, nothing could get between Peter and the Lord. You would think that. He had it all. As a matter of fact, it was Jesus that talked about Peter. Peter kind of, I think, had a big ego. Maybe a type A personality. Maybe a little pushy at times. But he also had hoof and mouth disease. <laughs> he put his foot in his mouth several times. And then the ultimate betrayal, denying him in his time of need. And Jesus looks over at him and he sees him by the fire and Peter's looking at him and he's denying that he even knows him. And now he's cursing at the people for accusing him. He's busted. He's got a Galilean accent. He can't hide it. They know he's with Jesus. But yet he's still lying. He's still trying to protect himself. So did Jesus say, sorry, Pete, you're done. You're going to burn in hell. Right along with Judas. You, you did the same thing that Judas did to me, pretty much. You've betrayed me. Did Jesus do that? No. Did Peter have to go through a period of time where he began to realize the seriousness of what he had done? Yeah, he did. He got to a point where he just gave up and said, you know what, I'm just going back to fishing. I'm done with all this apostle stuff. I'm going back to my boat and I'm going back to my fishing business. It's safe there. But that wasn't God's plan for Peter. So we can draw these parallels with David, with Peter, with our lives. And we can see, you know, sometimes we get off track. And it can be years that we're off track. It's not a week or a month. So now David is beginning to see some of the results of his bad choices. He should have been taking care of his business, and he wasn't. So David and his men in verse 3 came to the city, and there it was, burned. All their loved ones are gone. The city's burned down. And so verse 4, David and the people who were with him, they lifted up their voices and they wept until they had no more power to weep. Wow, that's serious business there. That's true brokenness. But that's what the world offers us in the end. That's what we wind up with. Brokenness. Loss. At this point, they don't have a clue whether their loved ones are dead or alive. They don't know. Now the narration in our story tells us they did not kill them. But I seriously doubt that, that David and his men knew that at this point. All they knew is the city was burned up and everybody was taken away. And they wept until they had no more power to weep. Wow. You know, you suffer the loss of a loved one and you just, you cry until you got no more tears. You learn where the term heartache comes from. Because it truly does hurt when you're grieving like that. It's painful. I can't imagine what they're going through right now. I can't imagine what David's 600 men are thinking about David as their leader. What kind of leader are you? You've drug us over there to hang out with Achish and now all of our loved ones are gone. David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, 
And Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. <laughs> I'd say they're a little bent out of shape, right? What kind of leader are you, David? First of all, you got us in enemy territory all this time. Now our families have been destroyed. Our homes are destroyed. And now we're going to destroy you. People wanted to stone him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and daughters. And then there's a sentence there that is refreshing at this point. It's a sentence that brings hope. And it says that David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Now you see there the word Lord capitalized and the word God capitalized. How did he strengthen himself? What did he do? You think he repented? You think he fell on his face before God and confessed that he's played the fool? And asked God for his forgiveness? He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And then David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, Please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. Now you remember, Abiathar was the priest's son who escaped the slaughter when Saul went and killed all those priests because they gave David bread. And he slew every one of them. The whole city of priests. It was a priest school, pastor's college, whatever. And he went and killed them all. But the son of Ahimelech, his son, escaped. And you might remember when David encountered him, he said, come with me and I'll take care of you. And so this young man goes with David, Abiathar, and begins to serve in the role of priest. So he has the ephod, the breastplate, the, the plate that has 12 stones in it, one for each tribe, a different stone for each tribe. A very interesting piece of gear, equipment. And somehow or another that and the, the Ark of the Covenant uh, were symbols of power. They generated power. You remember what the Ark did when it was in Philistine territory, the hemorrhoid problem, right? You remember that. Wherever that Ark went, if it wasn't in Hebrew hands, it was creating some trouble. It was a powerful thing. And the ephod also had a sto two stones that the priest would have in a pouch and you would ask the Lord, should I go or not? And the priest would reach in his pocket and pull out one of the stones. If it was white, it would mean go. If it was the black stone, the answer was no, don't go. So a lot of times before they would go into battle, that's how they would inquire of the Lord. Kind of like drawn straws in a way. We see that happen in the book of Acts, too. They were still practicing that at the beginning. When they were trying to figure out who was going to replace Judas. Because there were only 11 left. And so they got these guys together and they said, Well, we got these three or four guys right here that, that could, you know, they saw the resurrected Lord. They were with us during his ministry. Um, and so... How did they decide which one was going to take Judas's place? They drew lots. Same thing as drawing straws, or the ephah, uh, the the urim and the thummim. It was called these two stones that they used. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, "Shall I pursue this troop and overtake them?" And he answered him, "Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail." 
recover all. Wow, that's mercy right there, you guys. You're going to recover everything, your children, your wives, your possessions, your flocks. So David went. He and the 600 men who were with him. And they came to the brook Bezor, where those stayed who were left behind. But David pursued, he and 400 men. This is not a short walk. It's about 60 miles. It's a pretty good march. And 200 of these guys, and they're carrying all their supplies, they're carrying all their weapons, they're heavy laden, and they're on this march to go avenge their families. And 200 of them got so wore out they couldn't go any further. And so David left them behind. And he left them behind with all of their supplies to watch the supplies. And then they found an Egyptian in the field and they brought him to David and gave him bread. And he ate and they let him drink water. And they gave him a piece of uh, a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his strength came back to him. For he had eaten no bread or drank no water for three days and three nights. David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am, a, I am a young man from Egypt, the servant of an Amalekite. And my master left me behind, because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion of the southern area of the Carathites, in the territory which belongs to Judah, and of the southern area of Caleb. And we burned Ziglag with fire. Uh-oh. I, wonder, I don't think this guy knows who David is. And David said to him, Can you take me down to this troop? And so he said, Swear to me by God that you will neither kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to the troop. So he comes clean with David. He was with the army that burned down David's homes, took his family. So verse 16, when he had brought him down, interesting to me that they bumped into this Egyptian boy, young servant, out in the middle of the wilderness. Where are the odds of that? You know, not very good. And he just happened to be the slave of an Amalekite soldier. It looks like he was probably forced to do what, to serve this master that he had by going with him into battle. <clears throat> but it seems almost as though it was God's hand that put that Egyptian boy there in order that he might reveal to David where the enemy was. God's at work behind the scenes, always. Always at work. And when he had brought him down there they were, spread out over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. So they're partying. They're having a celebration. They're having a feast. They're making merry. They're playing music. They've had a great victory. And, you know, if you're, say you're a kind of a worldly person, if you will, they had everything that you would want. They had all the goodies that you would want. You know, there was alcohol back in those days. And there was also drugs back in those days. A lot of drugs. Not like we think of them today, but, you know, they were organic drugs. Maybe magic mushrooms or something, you know, psilocybin or something. But they would use it, the, these peoples would use these things, uh, especially hallucinogens, to contact spirits. So when they would... Uh, encounter a witch 
she would have these drugs that would help her to get in touch with the spirit that they're trying to reach. And it's interesting that the uh, the word for witchcraft in the Old Testament, the word is pharmakia. So a sorcerer would use witchcraft um, to summon spirits, Samuel, whatever. But the, that word is pharmakia, which we get our English word pharmaceutical from. So we know that they use these powerful, powerful drugs in their attempt to reach the spirit world. Uh, no different with Native Americans in, in past history. They did the same thing. They used peyote. They would use all kinds of different things like that to, to have a, a, a revelation, a, a, an awakening, if you will. It was a rite of passage. Um, they had sorcerers, witch doctors, whatever you want to call them. So it wasn't limited just to this area of the world. It would appear that it was pretty much all over the place. But So anyway, I kind of got off on a little tangent there. But uh, So they're partying. They're having a great time. It says they're spread out. That's an important fact. They're not together. They're not prepared to do battle. They're all spread out. They're vulnerable. Don't know how many of them there were. But there were probably a lot. And remember now, David only has 400 with him. So David attacked them from the twilight until the evening of the next day. And not a man of them escaped, except for 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So these boogers got away. 400 of them. Where do you think they're going to go? They're going to go back and tell the other army, hey, we just got smeared by David. He's got 400 people. But David wins a great victory there that day. Long battle. From morning until night, it says. All day they fought. And so David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. <clears throat> Why are the Amalekites still a problem? You know, when the, when, when the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan, when they were delivered from Israel, one of the very first peoples that they encountered was Amalek. And they asked for his help. And instead of helping them, he ambushed them and killed a lot of them. As a matter of fact... He did it sneaky. You know, when they would be traveling like that, they would have all their mighty men in front. And then, they, you know, they'd have the, the people carrying the supplies within the, the troop and, and maybe some of the other soldiers following them. And then behind them, you would have the women and the elderly and the children. So... When he came in and attacked them from behind, he was attacking the women and the children and the elderly people. What a scoundrel. Amalek was a bad man, and these are his descendants now. Ever since Israel got into the promised land, the Amaleks have been a problem, the Amalekites. They wouldn't have been a problem if... Saul would have done what God told him to do. And so again, we draw a correlation here. God wants us to be free from the bondage of sin. From practicing things that bring harm to us. That will creep up from behind us and get us at our weak moment. And so here they are, again, showing up on the scene. But David wins a victory against this little group of them. And they recovered everything. That's amazing. That's exactly what 
the, uh, the young man, the young priest, told him, nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. That's amazing. That's God's protection. That's God's providence right there. He recovered everything. And not only that, he also took their flocks and their herds that they had driven before those other livestock. And they said, this is David's spoil. Spoil, booty, reward for battle, confiscating valuables, however you want to look at it. So they come back with more than they lost in the first place. Then we have kind of an interesting pause here in the chapter. It says that David came to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David, whom they also had made to stay at the brook Bezor. And so they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. He's coming back with all the families. He's coming back with all the stuff. Coming back with more herds. And they go out to meet David and they're not really excited about stoning him now. Now he's a hero. I read a book by Oswald Sanders many years ago, and he said in the book that many times a man of God will come against criticism, condemnation, and the people will stone him. And then after he's stoned and buried... They'll take the very same stones and build a monument to that same person. It just shows how fickle people are. <clears throat> it wasn't very long ago they wanted to stone Daniel, David, and now, now they're running out to meet him. So they went out to meet him. He greeted them. And verse 22 is interesting. It says, then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered and said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered. In other words, they couldn't make it. They couldn't cross over the brook. They were out of juice. We left them behind with all of our supplies and we won, won a great victory and we're not sharing it with them. Interesting how they are categorized here. Worthless, wicked men. <laughs> wow, selfish would have probably been enough, but worthless, wicked men. That's, uh, it tells you a lot about these guys. Every single one of them probably had their own agenda, and they did not want to share at all. But David said, my brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us, who has preserved us and delivered into our hands the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? But as his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stayed by the supplies. They shall share alike. And so it was from that day forward, he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel to this day. It became a law in Israel. If you went into battle and you won the spoil, then you would go back to your village and share it with the rest. You would share, the share in the reward. Kind of like 
we send like missionaries out. Some go and then some stay to provide for the ones who go. Kind of the same principle. And we all get the same reward. So it says, when David came to Ziglag, verse 26, that he sent some of the spoils to the elders of Judah and to his friends, saying, here's a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. And then we have a list of all the cities there that he sent gifts to. He's trying to win the people's hearts back, I think. He's trying to win their affection again. And uh, that's how that chapter ends. Matter of fact, verse 31 says, He gave stuff uh, in Hebron and to all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed to roam or rove. Then it says the Philistines were fighting against Israel and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines. And they fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons. And the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Mount Keshua, Saul's sons. And the battle became fierce against Saul, and the archer hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. And then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it committed suicide, or attempted to. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So as far as the armor bearer was concerned, it looked as though Saul had died. And so Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all of his men died together that same day. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of the Jordan, saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead. They forsook the cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And so it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths. And they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. Now when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and traveled at night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Shan, and they came to Jabesh, and they burned them there. And then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh, and fasted for seven days. What Samuel had told Saul through the witch came to pass. He lost it all. But there is one son that didn't go out to battle, one of Saul's sons. And we're going to learn more about him as we go through. And we're going to learn the reason he didn't go to battle was because he was a cripple. So he has one child left. Who will take the throne? Who will become king of Israel? And we also see here that it would appear... that Saul committed suicide. But next week when we start 2 Samuel, we're going to find a little bit different account of this uh, event. But what struck me in verse 7 was that the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel fled. They had taken these cities and they were occupying all these towns. 
You know, God showed them the land that they were to take. You know, they never did take all the land that God gave to them. They never did. They took part of it. And when they had enough, they figured they were okay. We don't need to do any more fighting. We'll just be content with this. There was more land that God gave to the Hebrews. They were occupying these little cities. But now they're afraid because their king is dead and they ran away. They abandoned the city. And what happens? The enemy comes in and takes possession of it. Interesting thing to see there. That when we try to, when we, when we become afraid, when we, when we run away, when we abandon the things that we have captured, in a sense, in our lives, we open ourselves up. It can be very dangerous. And the enemy will try to creep in. And he'll try to reclaim us, our past, our bad habits, whatever it might be. But he will try to reclaim it from us. And that's what we see happen here. They forsook the cities and fled. Interesting how they deal with uh, Saul's body. <laughs> First his head's chopped off. Then he's nailed up on a wall. Hanging on a wall. And then they come and steal his body. And they take it and burn it. And then bury his bones. And then they fasted for seven days. Because they lost their king. And so that's the end of the story in 1 Samuel. David still hasn't become king. He's still struggling with his role. He still doesn't quite know his destiny. And we'll see that kind of take shape as we move in to the next chapter. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this awesome record. We want to thank you for the spirit lessons that are there, Lord, for our own learning today. We want to thank you that you've showed us things that can help us to avoid making the same kinds of mistakes. Thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Be with us as we go home. Keep us safe. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.